everyone. Um, before we get started, uh, I'm Dean Liang. I'm the Chief Information Officer at uh, Holland and Knight. I just want to do a quick poll of the audience. We will tailor the session a little bit depending on whether this crowd is more technical or more uh, business oriented. So show of hands, who's really more on the tech side of Link? Most people. Who's on the business side? Okay, we'll, we'll try to keep that balance. Okay, great. Um, so as I said, I'm the Chief Information Officer at Holland and Knight. I've had 20 years experience in, in IT and I'm what people call the technical CIO. Um, I do know um, a lot about uh, IT in general. I didn't get into IT because I wanted to be in management. I actually really like the technology. Um, I have my MCSE, my old CNE, if you remember that far back. Uh, I was Microsoft Certified Trainer for a little while. And my degree is in electrical engineering. So if you guys want to talk a little bit more about the specific technical business ROIs, happy to, to jump into that. Um, I've worked in legal, um, education, manufacturing, uh, and consulting. And just as another organization that I'm a part of is I am a volunteer for the International Legal Technology Association, which is a legal vertical that's dedicated to basically information sharing between firms and such on on what we're doing, uh, specifically my role there is with the communication technologies. Jesse? I'm Jesse Ortiz, I'm the communications manager at Holland and Knight. So my, my uh, area includes uh, messaging, email, uh, voice, information, just cut, cut off, um, video conferencing and mobile devices. So anything that encompasses that area is in, is in my, um, my department. And I've also been in IT for about 20 years. Right, so <clears throat> the whole message here is the fact that we're a professional services organization and one of the daunting tasks that we have to deal with is unlike Microsoft pushing it out or, or a high tech company pushing it out, we, our user base is fundamentally liberal arts based so they're non-techies. Non These aren't people that typically live and breathe uh, technology. We have a thousand attorneys, about uh, 20 offices both domestic and, uh, and international and uh, we're a full services uh, law firm. Now, one of the unique things about a law firm, if you're not familiar with it, is it's a precedent-based industry. So it's tough to always move things ahead, especially in new technologies and new things, because they're always asking, what are other law firms doing? What's case history? What's precedent? What's all that background uh, behind it before moving forward? And it was initially a challenge in terms of moving Link forward because of that, because uh, we are sort of stuck a little bit in, in the past. Uh, with the legal industry, there's really two key things. There's, there's things that are discoverable, so anything that's on paper, anything that's recorded, uh, anything that's in the courts, and that's words on paper, that's email. And then there's oral communications, which is actually off the record, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the sidebars as, uh, as, uh, as, you, uh, uh, as everybody sees on, on TV and such. Um, for us, we decided that Link was going to be all in the oral communication side. So even for the um, IM portions, we don't track, we don't record, and we specifically make note of that, that it's supposed to be for transactional uh, conversations and such. Our firm, even though we have a thousand attorneys, very much works in pods, pods and teams. So we have partners and associates that work together, and we also have the attorneys, which is the partners and associates, working with the uh, assistants. It's primarily a four to one ratio. And this is something that's important when we talk about some of the boss admin functionality because it's not a, a one to one uh, assistant uh, attorney ratio. It's specifically we have about four attorneys for every assistant uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, works within uh, the, the firm. Uh, in terms of workflow, the majority of the work is done in Outlook, uh, in Word, and in voice communication. So things on the, the telephone uh, itself. Um, one of the big drivers that uh, we're talking about in terms of uh, why we actually moved to Link was really just to have a single platform for um, our users to collaborate internally because we have offices from Asia all the way to the Middle East. So there really isn't a time of day where there isn't, a, um, uh, where there isn't an office open somewhere in the world. So there's a lot of need and drive to be able to respond quickly um, as we look at not only targeting the work to the right expertise within the firm to leverage our size, but also targeting to the appropriate cost center because we have different offices that have uh, uh, different uh, cost structures based, on, uh, based on, on time. And based, based on that as well, we also want to have the system be able to communicate well uh, with our clients. We want to be the go-to people that, uh, that our clients uh, go to in terms of, of IM or voice escalation in terms of, of communication. Uh, it, we are a time-based 
uh, professional services organization, so it's all about the billable hour. So we're driving two things. One, to be more efficient in that billable hour and to be able to get as much time billed as, as possible. Uh, we, build in, we build in point one uh, increments uh, through the hours, so a point one is about six minutes. So we can get a client to engage and actually have a conversation with us, regardless of the term of, of, of the conversation, it's point one. And just using simple math, uh, our typical associate might be $360 an hour, that's $60 right there. It's not uncommon for attorneys to go up to $700, $800 an hour, $120 if we can actually uh, initiate that, uh, that communication. So jumping more into the technical aspects. Sure. So before we looked at deploying Link 2013, we, uh, we had a lot of technology in the offices still. We had a lot of capabilities that the lawyers could, could use. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that they could do wasn't really well known or understood how to do it. So they had all these capabilities that they would use a little bit after an announcement perhaps, but it would fall off by the wayside later. And we can go to the next slide here. So we can see here that we had, um, our pre-existing environment had pretty much all the features of unified communications. And we'll just go through it. We're, we're using a buyer for voice. We had an audio conferencing system um, from SoundPath, it was a hosted solution. We had web collaboration through Adobe Connect. Uh, video was a polycom system. And we also had I have a presence from, from Blink, uh, or sorry, from OCS. So we had all these features, but they weren't together. They were all these dispersed clients. Uh, attorneys really didn't make a lot of use of it because they had to jump between all these tools to, to do something. So they could be on a phone call if they wanted to jump to video. They had to hang up the phone call and fire up the polycom client. If they wanted to um, do a web presentation, they had to go to a different application, log into it, send a link. So it wasn't a very easy workflow for, these, for them to use. And because of this, it just really didn't get used that much. So we can see that even though these, these uh, solutions were best of breed many times, you know, very, very, uh, very well-known providers, it just wasn't integrated together. So it wasn't where we needed to be. Um, another problem that we had is that the age of the existing PBX was, uh, is about nine years old. So it was something that we had in our, in our minds that we were gonna have to replace it eventually and something we were looking at. And some of the things that we were trying to solve at the same time were, was uh, issues that were brought to light by different outages we had. So for example, in the uh, instance of, of uh, Superstorm Sandy in the Northeast, we had a PRI, PRI outage in our office that lasted a few days. And it just showed that even though our equipment was completely fine, our building had power, we couldn't do anything about it. We were just sitting there waiting for them to uh, restore services. In the meantime, all our phone numbers for our New York office were just busy or ringing to dead air. There was nothing we could do about it. And we were able to um, have internal calls still, so they, we could route it within our network and they could make calls out, but still, from the outside, it appeared like we were down. Um, another example of that same kind of scenario was when we had a local branch failure, so a PBX, um, would go down, and it's something that you can't necessarily remediate very quickly, and if your DIDs are going there, again, we have the same problem, that our phones from the outside world would go down. So a client would call, and we'd miss that chance to have some billable hours there. And the other thing we wanted to do was have um, the ability to work anywhere. So with our solutions that we had, some of them worked internal only, some of them were available outside, you had to use a VPN client, it just wasn't a very smooth transition for any of the stuff, so we wanted that, that, that uh, um, that ability to do it from any device, mobile devices, tablets, and everything else, from wherever they were, so their home or other offices. And the whole thing is, we needed it to be easy. You know, the, in our firm, um, iOS devices, by far, even though you hear Android devices have the majority of the market share, almost 90% of our devices are iOS de devices. Now, this is driven by a couple of things. One, is it's a premium device, so there's a certain cache value in, in having a premium device. But it's always easy to use. Like if there's ever a problem, you hit that home button and you get back there. And that's something that we were always fighting with as we started training all these different clients and, and, and options and such. And it, it really didn't make sense. So <clears throat> we decided to jump in and look at uh, the, the business drivers for, for upgrading. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, but for us, uh, above all else, we needed the phone system to work like a normal phone system. We needed people to be able to walk up, pick up the phone, dial nine, and make a phone call. Um, certainly there's tons of advantages and such that you get from Link in terms of all the, the phone plus features as I've coined it, but there's a, there's a portion of a demographics, and if you hear the, the one third rule, you know, one third love it, one third hate it, one third don't care, that we had to make sure that from a dial tone perspective that we had, that, uh, that we had everybody covered so that at the end of the day, if 
they choose not to do anything, they can just continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to move uh, uh, ahead. Um, so the cost savings. Uh, the traditional PBX model, we were spending over 400000 a year in just maintenance alone for the uh, for a tr traditional PBX system. So it doesn't take long to just work through the ROI to, to replace it. We're paying maintenance for each of these individual best of breed items from the uh, web conferencing with Adobe Connect. Uh, we had uh, per, per click charges uh, with uh, SoundPass, uh, et cetera. Uh, we wanted to refresh the desktop phones. Some of them were up to about 15 years old and such. And, Based on what I said about the premium device, people want a new shiny uh, phone uh, on, their, on their desk. Um, we also got the driver, the fact that uh, people coming in are using uh, more sophisticated technologies. They're used to using FaceTime to, to say goodbye and, and goodnight to, to their family. They're used to using Skype to, to call in their, their family. And again, it goes to that demographics. And by all means, it's not age related at all. It's just the demographics that, that's used to be able to, to use this, uh, this mobile uh, uh, technology. Um, efficiency and revenue generation is uh, something that I talked about earlier that's all about the billable hours. So we want to make sure that any lag time is minimized so that people can get on a call, start collaborating, and start billing uh, immediately. And our firm is, is progressive in that it really understands that technology is really one of the last tools out there where you can actually drive uh, efficiency, uh, productivity, uh, and revenue generation. Those of you that heard me in the, uh, in the keynote earlier today, was we are also embracing the fact that we want consumer-based technologies, assuming they're secure, to be able to drive into the enterprise. So that allows us to do two things. It allows us to minimize the training re required to get people up to speed quickly. But the more important thing is we're allowing people to use tools that's already effective in their day-to-day -day workflow in the enterprise environment. So we're not forcing or teaching them to use uh, something different in the, in the whole work environment. <clears throat> And of course, mobility, that is a, uh, a huge driver for work-life balance, being able to be accessible after hours uh, and, and, and such. And really, um, this came into its own for Link when we went from uh, 2010 to 2013. We had originally piloted 2010, thought that you know, on paper it looked good, but it was really 2013 that, uh, that got the, the mobility component to uh, where we needed uh, to be. <clears throat> on the mobility side, uh, we've made a conscious decision that we want people to have access to all electronic information they have available in the office, outside the office. And again, this isn't a one-size-fits-all. We really chose the uh, CYOD, choose your own device policy, and it's from a menu. So people, for example, can choose to have a desktop and an iPad. They can choose to have a notebook. They can choose to have a Surface device in lieu of their uh, notebook. Um, or they can just uh, have a, a, a combination there based on, on, that, uh, on, on their spend. Um, on our uh, uh, iPads already, we have um, a number of applications that run on there, and I'd be happy to, to show anybody uh, afterwards, but already on our uh, iOS device, we have Citrix, which gives people access to basically anything that's available in the office. But we're also running uh, Hightail, which is a secure replacement to Dropbox for file sharing. We're running our document management system on there so people can actually uh, access documents and, uh, and pull information off of there. Uh, we have DTE Axiom, which is a time and billing software. So again, if you're working remotely, collaborating remotely through Link, you can immediately go in and capture that time that would otherwise be lost if you're like, well, I'll remember to enter this time later. That never happens. So that really was, uh, that, that's really uh, an efficiency gain there and that people were finding lost time that just wasn't being uh, entered. Uh, there's also a huge drive to be using these mobile devices in the courtrooms as, again, with data connections being somewhat ubiquitous now, to be able to just to pull the huge caches of data on an as-needed basis, as opposed to coming into court with reams and reams of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of paper uh, and such. Um, other things that we're doing, everything's managed through <coughs> MDM, of course. Um, but it's the desire not to give up multiple numbers. Sometimes you're working with opposing counsel, you don't want to give opposing counsel your, your personal cell phone number. You just want them to be able to call and be able to access uh, you where, wherever it is that, that you are. Um, again, also with uh, ease of number recognition, I think now I finally recognize Jesse's cell phone number, so I, I will pick up my phone if, if, <laughs> if I see it ringing. But that's, that's the problem. I, I have about 50 people out, uh, out in the field, so it's difficult with, uh, just on first pass to be able to pick up the phone and collaborate. If you think about from a worldwide perspective, the challenge is to try and recognize whether or not that's somebody that you want to collaborate with immediately. 
With Link, with that driver, you get the five-digit calling. That's a, we use five-digit internal calling. You get the name, you get the number display, and that removes one of the barriers in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, collaboration. Um, the voice over IP capabilities in 2013 really allows us to augment any cellular dead spots. And <clears throat> many of these large office towers and stuff have many dead spots out there. and allows our people to roam and not be tethered in their office or having to forward it to, to their cell phone. They simply just sit there uh, wherever they are, even at home with Wi-Fi, and they can actually have their, their local office uh, number ringing. Um, now, one thing that we've worked on is one of the challenges that we found when we've been working with mobility is um, mobility gets a little bit of a bad rap. Sometimes we hear, um, using a different analogy, people say that Citrix sucks. Well, you know, Citrix generally doesn't suck. Citrix is a very good platform out there, but the problem is, is it's not understanding the underlying transport as to why uh, it's not working from a connectivity perspective. So we're developing a little application where it's a connectivity dashboard where it's green good, red bad. And it just goes and it shows you for each of the particular services that I mentioned before, whether or not you have enough bandwidth and whether the latency is low enough for that communication to work. If it's green, you press a button, it launches and, and it goes. If it's red, it just doesn't work because that just cuts down another one of those uh, items where people can misperceive that the problem is actually the, the, uh, the technology. So talking about the, uh, the ROI, um, we, uh, Jesse actually found a good third party, uh, PBX uh, maintenance people, which actually dropped our, our maintenance by, by 200,000 per year and made it a little bit harder for us to justify uh, link to deploy, but that just really pushed our ROI from two years out to about four years, so it still made sense. And we were just replacing dial tone with that savings. It's not talking about all the uh, uh, additional benefits uh, uh, out there. Um, our PBX maintenance was particularly high because our offices were formed through a series of mergers uh, about 10 years ago, so there was all this local PBX infrastructure and such. And once we started phasing that out, and we'll talk about centralized versus uh, decentralized uh, in, in a moment, those cost savings uh, really come in there. The other hard savings that's not listed on here is that by utilizing Microsoft-based technology, by using uh, Microsoft servers and such, we're able to use our DR and BC infrastructure that we use for the rest of our environment in terms of a VM-based environment, uh, using uh, replication, using NetApps uh, to, to replicate the data. It was easy at that point to lump it all together and make that a, a critical uh, tier one uh, application. Productivity gains, um, I've already talked about, so I'm just going to flip the page. Jesse? So, so Link versus Cisco, we, we spent a lot of time looking at these uh, two solutions. Um, really, at Cisco, we, we, we were pretty close to actually deploying it. Um, we had POs on my desk. This is how, <laughs> how close it came. <laughs> we, we did. Um, so we, we ended up doing a Cisco Tamburg video implementation, which was kind of even driving us more that way. We replaced our, our Polycon system was probably nine, ten years old. It was very, very dated. And when, once we did that, it seemed like it made a lot of sense for us to just go ahead and do the phone piece with them as well. The phones are very mature. They have all the features that you know, we had that we were used to and things that we didn't even use, need. So from that perspective, it was a very good fit. But when we started looking at the desktop side of it is when it still st started um, not quite fitting what we wanted. They do have all these, these applications. And, and just to preface this, this was back in 2010 or 2011, really. So it's, a little bit of time has passed since we did this comparison, but they had different clients for everything. So they had an IM client, they had a, a separate video client. Um, if you went into go to a, to a conference, a web conference, you had to escalate it into WebEx. So you were still using all these different things. They tried to integrate them together, but you know, it's, still, it's still not just one simple client that you're staying in within the whole time. And also on the back end, it required a lot of um, more complex infrastructure to support this, this same thing. So the user didn't see that but it was still there for administratively to deal with. The other thing we looked at was um, the version of Cookie Link. So we thought, well, these phones are great. We really like Link. We already have it deployed for Iron Presence. What if we just integrate, integrate these two? And that's the, you know, the idea that Cisco has once you weren't too happy with their other solution. And you know, it, it just felt like it was bandaging things too much, too much for us. It, was, um, it works, but there's too many times when it's confusing, like you're not sure if you're starting a link call or if you're starting a Cisco call, and you can end up getting yourself just into a, a strange predicament sometimes, and it was just some, something that we thought would really frustrate users. So we took that one off the table as well. And the other concern we had with it 
was uh, Cisco's keeping up with Microsoft um, releases. So when the next version of Link came out, how long was it going to take until we could adopt it once they supported it? So we just didn't want to go down that route and risk putting ourselves into this another mixed architecture again. Um, cost, something that is obvious. So we have a uh, EA with Microsoft, so Link belonged to us already versus Cisco. We'd have to go and purchase all the licenses, um, which can get expensive and, and a little bit confusing. There's so many different options, at least at the time there were. I think they've simplified that as well now. But it was something else that we, we, uh, we looked at when we were doing it. And really one of the key differences <clears throat> between Cisco and Link is it, Cisco, I mean, they've been on the scene for, for over t for 10 plus years now. So 10 plus years ago, it was all about the phone. It was the, the Cisco came in and they tried to uh, take out the PBX vendors based on VoIP on a phone-based experience. Once we really started driving into it and we looked at the, the comparative the features and such is, sure, Cisco had feature parity with all the PBX functionality, but once we started moving to that whole IM realm with either Cookie Link, or once we started looking at how do we integrate that with Office and SharePoint, and how do we get voice, uh, sorry, not just voice, but video collaboration, whiteboard collaboration, web collaboration, that all fought back out again to almost like a, a, to a best of breed like solution. It didn't give us that single interface that we really wanted. So when we drove and we looked at Link, the experience was completely different in that it was all centered around the desktop first. You had all the plus functionality there, and they started to push out to the phone-based uh, features out there where you got, uh, we got dial tone and, and conferencing all on, all on a particular phone. Um, so the pros and cons that we, that we looked through, uh, the single pane of glass w was critical for us. And really, we saw the evolution of the feature and functionality with Microsoft Link moving much faster than with the, uh, with the Cisco uh, client. The tight integration with Office is, uh, is critical. But even today, like we, I was thrilled uh, when we heard about the Skype integration with, uh, with Link, because that's really what our Latin American and our Middle East offices are pushing for, because that's simply how they work with their clients locally. But one of the greatest requests that I should get for Link domestically is, they simply want to use uh, Skype to, um, sorry, request for Skype, is they simply want to use Skype to call home and say goodnight to their kids. And you know, if that's the quality of life item that I can give them so that they can actually continue to work and bill more hours, absolutely, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get that to them. Um, some of the problems with, uh, with, with Link that we're working through is that the, the functionality is, is not fully featured in terms of, of the handsets. I'd say it's about 85%. And really, there's, there's only a couple of, of items that we've actually had to, had to give up. But it's now at a maturity level where uh, we can actually adopt it in, in the enterprise. Um, some of the P PBX features uh, aren't uh, easily done. And as opposed to being done centrally with a PBX system, it's actually done at the, at the user level. And you know, from a concierge level of support where things are just taken care, for, uh, taken care of uh, for you when you call the help desk, it was a little bit of a shift in focus in terms of, well, let me talk you through how you actually do these changes, helping people understand that the power is you can, you can change this around as it makes sense uh, for you. In fact, uh, one of the functionalities for um, the traditional PBX systems that the only workaround was if you worked in two or three offices was you had two or three different phone numbers so that people can actually call you at those locations. Uh, one of the things that we've been uh, working with right now is because there's a single number reach functionality, we've now had to go back and untrain our users to help them understand that this is actually a benefit now. This is like you having a cell phone number that will ring anywhere. You should give up all these different numbers and just be, be accessible through a, uh, a single uh, interface. Um, the UI has... From a technical perspective, it works, but from an end user perspective, I wish there was a little bit more contextual awareness that if you're in a conference call, the screen's maybe not a ribbon, I'm a huge fan of the ribbon, but something that changes contextually so you can then go in and be able to select and make a conference call, add another attendee, escalate to video versus having to jump around and, uh, and find things. I think one thing that I didn't know is when you're in a conference call, um, if you wanted the dial pad, I always went back to the main interface to hit the little dial pad number, but Jesse told me today that if you actually hover over the mute button, the dial pad comes up. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, the functionality is, is, is certainly there. Um, <clears throat> the handset functionality is certainly catching up, uh, but it's developed primarily by third parties, and it does lag the desktop client in terms of, of features and, and functionality, and they're working hard to, to catch up. 
uh, but it's still uh, not, not where we would like it to be. It's certainly very usable and, and, it, and it works. And there's just the perception issue of dial tone. There's just that, that whole, I don't want to be rebooting my phone once a week because I need to reboot my desktop once a week. And that's, that's just an awareness issue that, you know, it's the health of the computer. Certainly, if you're running other applications and stuff that are, that are unstable, you do need to reboot your computer periodically. But since we've deployed uh, the latest firmware on some of our phones, we haven't had any uh, issues uh, with that uh, at all. So since voice is such an important um, thing to us, we issued a, a formal RFP to several uh, integrators, VARs, to um, propose an installation process for us to help us deploy Link. Um, it's obviously something that we could have looked at doing ourselves, but we felt that it's such a complicated installation. It's only a one-time thing where we're going to get the system up that it didn't make sense for us to go try and get training for our people and go through the learning pains of trying to get it installed. So we issued this out to quite a few um, of ours. And the, the key thing that we wanted in there really was first, as Dean mentioned, the reliability had to be there in the, in the design. The voice had to be up. Um, our current PBX, as long as something didn't change to it, was very, very solid. So a change could be something as simple as a reboot, unfortunately. But if you left it alone, nothing happened to it. It really just kept running. Um, the other thing that we were trying to do, as Dean mentioned, had to be easy to use. So trying to build that into the design as much as possible. Um, ability to mimic most of the features in use in the PBX, that's something that kind of caught us up for a while. So we kept looking at all the things that the PBS could do, all the features that it had in the back end, um, all these complicated routes that some people would put into use, and even some things that we weren't using. And we were thinking, well, how can we do this in Link? And then we realized, taking a step back, you know, just because we could do it doesn't mean that we want to keep doing it or that's the best solution for us. So what we had to do was um, just evaluate, really, the core reasons for why we were doing it. So the, the multiple phone numbers was a perfect example. Years ago, we did that because it was the only option. But today, now, we don't have to do that. So we're just trying to push back for it and, and really do what makes more sense for, for, the, for the users. Um, one of the things that we, we noticed with some of the integrators is that they, they really focused on the platform of Link. So they, were, they seemed like they could do a great job, the reliability, they could do the design, they could get the system up and running. But they didn't focus too much on the user experience of it. They, they were really just wanting to come, do a Link deployment, um, show people how to use the client, and not really taking into account what they were doing before so much. So they did all these things on the phone before, how, how they did it. And even if it doesn't have a direct translation to the new one, you know, what are the workarounds? How, how can we do this? How can we build it into it instead of just waiting for it all to happen? And then people were getting upset about the experience once they, once they got the new system. So that was something that we, um, we, we really wanted to, to focus on. Um, the other thing, so the ability to execute, as I mentioned, that's something that we felt a lot of them could do. Understanding the business was the other thing, as I mentioned, that we, they had to understand this whole attorney-secretary relationship so they could really understand how important it was to us that that had to work very well since it was something that just happens constantly in our organization. And the, the vendor we, we, um, we selected really did focus on that. They had excellent technical abilities, they, but they also had a very strong focus on the user experience the change management, and then the user adoption of it. So they followed up and they, they followed these processes to make sure that the, the system was, was a success as far as being accepted and used as well. And while that's not the norm we see a lot of times in IT, because we look at technology. We just want to get the technology out there, all the cool things. We don't look at how it really affects users or what they want. And something so key like voice, it's something they're so used to having. That's just you know a phone, pick it up, there should be a dial tone. If it's complex to use, they, they're not going to want anything to do with it. And we find most often not that if projects fail, it's because people aren't addressing the user and change management issues in terms of that, that adoption uh, principle. If you just deploy it and hope that they'll, uh, they'll adopt it, they, they may, they may not. But if you focus on the change management and really help build the business case as to how it's going to help their workflow and their practice, um, that always leads to successful deployment. So <clears throat> along the way, there was a lot of decisions that we had to make. So we'll just briefly go over some of this stuff. Um, the pools that the users are associated with, there's different options. You can have them split up. We have, we have two data centers today. So do we have users live in both data centers, or do we have one that's just passive waiting? Um, we're in the middle of some other projects as well, moving one of the data centers. So we're in the process of just keeping everybody live in one, and then the other one's going to be there for a failover. We may readdress that later so we can have more of a balanced view and make sure that we know everything's working. But until we get the other one up to the point where we're done 
done making changes in it, this made more sense for, for us. Um, installing load balancers for, um, for, uh, for failover. So this is something that our VAR brought to our attention, that there was two options, load balancers, or you could use DNS to load balance. DNS is obviously a free setting, and load balancers, we didn't have them in place, so we had to purchase them. But it actually brought some of the um, availability to us. So federation, as Dean mentioned, to Skype is something that was really important to us. And um, if we didn't have load balancers, the failover, so if we, if we had a failover scenario, it, was, uh, it wasn't very easy for us to recover from it and keep federation up. Everything else would go over, but that one piece could break for a while, and it wasn't something that we wanted to have down since we were trying to really push it out and have people um, use it for business eventually, with the video especially. Um, one of the other things that we had, we had looked at doing was it, integrating with uh, Avaya. So we were, since the phones in, in, in that system really did everything we, had, we needed at the time, and they were ahead of the uh, link phones that we were looking at, we thought, well, maybe we can just use these phones, we can integrate voice with link and have both systems together. And that was something that you know, our VAR helped us with. We got it up and running, but really, in the end, we realized it's just a very complicated installation. We're managing two PBXs going forward, we have maintenance on both, and it really just didn't make a lot of sense to us. And there's a lot of situations that, even though it did work, that it complicated things and it didn't get into a better experience. So if they were on the phone, somebody could look at their status and link and it just shows them available, but they were on their via phone, so it, just, it, it could get complicated. Um, session session border controllers. So that's basically a, a firewall for the SIP connection that, we, that you're using to the outside world. And it's not necessarily 100% required in every situation, but for regulations, just for security, for peace of mind, having something there between your environment and the, the outside world seemed like something that we really wanted to have in place from a security perspective. And it also gives you some other features. So some of that integration with, with Avaya we were able to do that by having, having these, um, these extra pieces between the, the two systems to be able to help us integrate it. And it also helps with um, when you're looking at other carriers. So if a SIP provider isn't certified with Link, but they're certified with your SDC, it gives you the opportunity to, to have a wider range of, of them out there. Because especially if, a couple of years ago, there wasn't very many at all who were, who were um, certified to work with Link. So it's a, it's a nice thing, piece to have in the mix. Uh, we actually only went with Sonus. So those are the two that we actually had kind of uh, rounded down to. Um, you know, there's a lot of options out there and, and just things that made sense from it. We, we looked at um, different aspects of it. So like their support models, um, the carriers that they integrate with, and just a whole range of things there. And we felt that Sonus fit better for our organization. Um, SIP versus PRIs. So today we, we, we are still using PRIs, but we want to um, move towards a SIP environment. Um, we, we feel that SIP is really, you know, we were doing a, a fresh installation from scratch. That's the way you would go. Uh, even though PRIs are, are more um, prevalent, it's really what we see as the future. Um, There's some things that you had to, we, we had to take into account. So obviously, once you, you're doing that, you have more network utilization. You have to make sure you have all the proper QoS in place. Um, and then you, there's, other, there's other things that we're getting from it, such as uh, c capabilities to forward phones from the provider. So in a worst case scenario, like if we had a complete outage for whatever reason, our data centers were down or somebody made a change that took things down, we can pre-stage it so that it can forward to a cell phone someplace or to individual cell phones. And that's something that we talked to when we were looking at providers. You know, do you have these capabilities? Can we give you this Excel sheet, basically, or CSV with everybody's number, and we can build this table and have it staged, ready to go? So that's one of the things that we were looking at. It also gives you a lot of flexibility in things. So in the case of that Superstorm Sandy, for example, we, we, were waiting, we were waiting for the carrier to be able to forward our numbers. And they eventually did do it before all the services were restored, but it still took them to forward the main number, I think, two or three days until we had that, that reception number even go any place. And in a SIP world, you know, that would have been the ability for us to be able to go and do it, because it was just really, from the providers, a matter of queue. They had so many requests to do it, they were just very behind, and it. It, took, it took days for them to make that happen. So that's another reason that we're, we're looking for, for um, moving to SIP. 
Um, some of the caveats with it are the things that we're, we, we noticed, um, have concerns about is faxing. That's the biggest one. We were initially trying to deploy or looking at um, an IP faxing solution. So as we were talking to them, we were making sure that they could support that. And as we were talking to carriers and um, more importantly, and other people who had actually deployed it, we found that they felt like a very good success rate was 85 to 90%. They said if you were doing, getting that success rate that you were doing great. Don't expect any more than that. And when we heard that, we were like, okay, well, wait a minute, that's not gonna work for us because uh, we have a lot of really long faxes, unfortunately. So it's not, we didn't want to make it a worse experience for people, obviously. So what we're doing is you know, we're gonna keep a PRI in a data center and just forward those phone numbers in all the offices because we have local fax numbers every place to a centralized PRI and be able to keep that same analog experience, the reliability of it, the success rate should stay the same but we'll still be able to really reduce how much infrastructure we have out there because we're not going to have anything in the offices doing this, and we can just have a single PRI there to handle, have, handle everything. Um, phones, so we spent, again, this started in 2010, so at the time, we were, we were mainly focusing on um, Polycom and SNOM. Those seemed to be the, the, the strongest players at the time. And then, as I mentioned, we also, with our, with our integration, we started looking at trying to keep the Avaya phones in there. And um, we, really, we really were, were um, trying to mimic all the same features that we had with, with Avaya at the time. And, you know, we, we started thinking, well, you know, what do we really need from it? And what, what can we get? And how can we make it work for our business and for our needs? And... Uh, we went back to the initial goal is that we just had to really replace the dial tone and then have those features that were required for the business to start with. Um, some of the stuff that we, we, uh, we focused on with the phones were um, the link optimized versus qualified. You know, initially we were trying all these different optimized handsets and we realized, well, these all have the same feature set. You know, the, the hardware is a little bit different, but it's all the same, the same phone internally or, or from an OS level, so you're not getting anything differently. So then we started looking at the qualified handsets and um, they, they definitely had more features, but there's some more caveats with them. Um, so, you know, we started looking at support models. So it's not a Microsoft OS, so you had to worry about, you know, how, how involved is the maker in supporting you if you get into a problem? How's their turnaround time for bug fixes? Um, features, they seem to leapfrog each other with what they have first. So depending when you're looking at it and what you need to have happen, you know, one might be ahead of the other. So it was something that we, we spent a lot of time with. In the end, we, um, we ended up with the uh, Polycom VVX series of phones. Um, I think that's on the next slide there. So the CX series of phones, you know, it's a very mature phone. It's a very nice experience. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any of the boss admin functionality that we needed. So it kind of took it off the table for us. Um, we also were unsure of roadmaps for it. How much is, really gonna, is Microsoft really going to keep developing on it? Because they don't seem to be releasing a lot of uh, new features for it, and we haven't really heard too much news about them coming out with a new version of it or anything. So it seems to us, you know, we, we, that they're really starting to rely more on the makers of uh, qualified sets, and these are the guys that are really looking, have really far out roadmaps with a lot of features to try and start mimicking what's really out there in the PBX phones and replacing what we have with, uh, with Avaya. So we feel it has a really good long-term potential for us in the, uh, in the environment. Um, the Polycom CX3000 phones, so that one is running the Link OS, obviously, uh, but it's a very simple phone to use. So a user can just go up to it, dial a number, and make it work. So they don't even realize they're using Link, usually, because it's just a phone to them. We actually have a, a number in production. We had an office remodel, and we, instead of putting more money into buying the other ones, we, we deployed the Link phones to it. And it just works. People don't know that they're using Link at that point, which is actually a, a nice, a nice um, sales pitch to them. Because when you hear Link as a voice solution, some of them, or Microsoft as a voice solution, they're like, what is this that you're talking about? You know, is this really something that we should be looking at? And you can tell them, well, actually, you know, you've been using it already in the conference rooms. You know, have you had problems with it? And so far, we haven't had a single complaint about it. We just had switched them in. We didn't have any training and no announcements. Just put them there, and people have been using them. Um, and we've had 32,000 minutes of usage on these conference phones already. So this is not a, a small little pilot. These are heavily used. People don't even know. I mean, in fact, you put a piece of black tape over that little link light, then people would have <laughs> no idea that it was a link-based phone. 
Yep, and that was just in the last 30 days that we had that, that much traffic over them. So it's definitely something that seems like it's really stable for us. Um, and then going back into the video conferencing, uh, the Tamberg versus Polycom video integration. Uh, we, our our, our um, Tamberg system, we had just put it in not uh, probably uh, two years ago, I think almost three years ago at this point. And that was because we were also marching down the, the Cisco path. That's where we thought we, we were going to go. Right. Yeah, so you know, if we had known we would be able to deploy Link, the Polycom probably would have made more sense. It has a better integration story with it. But we, we were able to get it up and running, so we had it integrated with 2010 for a while. Um, Link 2013 came out, we, we got migrated to it, and it broke it. So again, it showed us the concerns of having too many things integrated from different, care, different um, companies, because we had to wait months, quite a, quite a few months, until Cisco released updates that allow us to put the integration back together. And then once they released it, we actually had to pay for it this time, so they, we, it cost us money when we weren't really planning on that ha happening to us. Um, the, the, the whole... The, that's, that's still a struggle for us, honestly, because the Cisco, um, the Cisco systems, we, you know, we have a bridge. It's very expensive port-wise to use. We're able to dial into it with Link, but how many people can we really op open it up to without just killing ourselves with cost of ports? Um, and it's also something that we're having a hard time gauging how much it would get used. So even to announce it out to people, we don't want to make a huge investment and then not get used. We don't want to announce it to people and then have a lot of people wanting to use it and then not having the capacity and turning them away because both of them ends up with a, with a bad user experience. So that was a reason that we were actually pretty excited today when we heard the uh, announcement of the keynote um, about the uh, video integration. So we're, we're looking forward to, to seeing that and hoping that it can help us along the way there as well. Hoping they don't charge us for it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Keep going. So our, our design blueprint here. So initially, we're trying to follow the, uh, the, the configuration that we have with Avaya. We, we have PRIs in the local offices. We're um, deploying uh, Link SBAs, survival branch appliances there. Those PRIs are there, so the office can just run alone, standalone situation. And we also have the uh, SBC in our data center that does integration to Avaya, and then eventually we'll have a subtrunk into it that will be migrating all the numbers um, to and having centralized. So there was a, a, a few reasons that we, we ended up doing this way first. You know, we, we, we looked at um, just initially deploying SIP with the link system and then migrating users to that. But in the interest of change management, and this is something that our VAR really pushed for, is that we should do it in steps. We did, we shouldn't try and make too many changes at one time, so we'll do the link migration first, prove that it's working, prove that it's stable, prove that we have uh, good quality with it, and then we can take that next step and migrate it to SIP, and that way we have more controls. We know if we have a problem, where, when it happened, what introduced it, instead of having all these things happen at one time and then really pulling our hair out trying, trying to fix it. And again, that's focusing on the user experience to make sure that we don't hurt them trying to, to make all these changes at the same time. Um, in our data center, so we made this decision to deploy all the servers in a virtualized environment, as, as Dean mentioned, so that helps follow our, our DR plan. So the, the virtual machines, if something happens, you know, we, we, can, we have the machines backed up, we could recover them. Um, we could move them to another data center if we, if we had to and rebuild them a lot faster than if we were starting from scratch with a, with a machine. Um, the SPCs we talked about and then the SIP lines will be in our, to our data center and eventually we'll have everything centralized there. So in this case, all these SBAs that we have deployed, we will eventually not have them in the office and everything will be routed back to our data center. And again, this is really to help us with those disaster recovery scenarios such as the Sandy or a PBX failure in an office if something happens to that office, you know, we, we still have the ability from the SIP carrier, at, at worst case, to just send that phone traffic someplace else if, if we need be. So we're not no longer dependent on that one, that one location being up. Users could be, you know, if, if something happens to the office, they could be home working in Link. They could have their number there. Everything would be, would be um, as normal for them. And just it's a, it's a sidebar. We're really pushing our, for our offices to not actually have any data in them at all. We want to centralize everything in the data center. The part of our DR and BC plan, we have notebooks that connect in through direct access straight into the data center. We have Citrix servers directly in the data center. So the fastest performance is to go directly to the data center. 
our goal in the offices is just to have an AD controller for authentication, a file and, and print server primarily for, for hosting uh, print and such, and keeping all uh, data off of there so that in the event of a local office failure, there is no loss of, uh, of operations. Yeah, people can get into Citrix and it's like nothing ever happened if they go someplace else. Um, so continue on to it. This is more of a line to what we want to see at the end state. So we want to have the SIP trunks centralized to our two data centers. Um, the branch resiliency, so you know, it sounds kind of a little bit funny looking at it because we don't have anything in the branches, but you know, there's different ways to look at it. And what we're doing is um, centralizing everything. So we already have, have, have our data and, and um, data there and services there, as Dean mentioned. We don't keep things in the local office, so that WAN connection to the data center is very important for everyone in those offices because that goes down. Today, they would have, they would have um, phones, but that's about it. They wouldn't be able to do anything else on their computers. So that being the case, there was a really a strong point for us to make that more redundant and move the voice central. So we're deploying a second MPLS network, different providers, so different points of entry to the building, just as, as, as different as we can. So we have a very high chance of never losing the connections to the office. And we, you know, we looked at other things. We looked at um, having just internet connections with a VPN backup in every office. We even talked about that call forwarding from the SIP provider being the worst case. So if it can't get into it, you know, we could have it fail over. But in the end, because we were making this drive to move everything centralized and keep things out of the office, it really made sense to just keep that connection as reliable as possible and be able to take care of it, uh, take advantage of that for the voice as well. Um, the international offices, they're, they're going to follow a different model, obviously. So there's the challenges of having um, different services in the, each of those locations. The phone numbers, obviously, we need to have local numbers there, so we can't deliver those to the US. We have to have something, something in the office. And um, so we'll be doing that SBA model, basically, that we had initially in each of those offices and having connection back to the US. Um, and some, just a sidebar with it, you know, we have these offices even in the UAE. And we were initially very concerned about what qual quality would be like over that much latency and that distance. And we actually deployed some IP phones with our old system, with our Avaya system as well. And we were very surprised that it was actually not, not bad. It was very acceptable. Every once in a while, it, and it, this was over the internet, not a dedicated link, you would hear something, a little clip or something, but it wasn't to the point where they found it unacceptable in any means. You know, they realized it's an international call to the other side of the world, so it was very, very well received. And the, the uh, fact that they knew that they didn't have to pay long distance for making those phone calls really offset any of those little things that they saw happening. They realized, you know, I'm no longer billing all this time for it. It's just a free call for me at this point. Um, so the concerns that we, we still do have around it is um, around monitoring and external support SLAs. So with the, that PBX model that we have, you know, we know it's very mature. Um, we have a a third party monitoring the system 24-7, as Dean mentioned, and they have spare parts for our PBX stored on our site. They have um, an SLA that is very strong, so if you have an outage, you know, they're, they're supposed to be on site and resolving that for us very quickly. And um, we, we were initially thinking with Link, you know, well, we, we, need to, we need to make something like that happen as well. And we started thinking, you know, we have the Microsoft Premier support. Is that something good enough for us for monitoring? Are we just going to use something like Mom or Operations Manager or some other third party ourselves to monitor it? There's some dedicated link um, products as well that we were looking at. So we haven't quite decided which way we're going with that. But something that we did think of with, with the scenario is, you know, with that PBX model, we had that maturity and all these, these things around it. But do we really need it with Link as much as we did with that scenario? You know, we're, we're, just, we're just not sure there. With, with the PPX, is it was specialized hardware. Um, it's not something that we could do ourselves a lot of times because it required uh, licensing and just things that, that we just couldn't, didn't have access to ourselves. So we're, we're just weighing those options still. And that's really where from a virtualized environment. That's, again, the, the, the power that we see of leveraging that fundamental infrastructure that we're not storing specialized parts or specialized hardware anywhere. As long as we have the fundamental infrastructure of the service running, we can run this, uh, we can run this, uh, run our own uh, uh, SLAs. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about security. I want to thank everyone for voting that this should be more technical than, than not because that meant instantly that Jesse was doing most of, of the talking, which is, <laughs> which, is, which is awesome. So thank you for that. Um, so from a security perspective, 
uh, we had to break down a few barriers there. So, you know, if, if you don't know, Link itself is actually highly secure. It uses full TLS in encryption end to end. And even when the integration with Skype uses full uh, TLS encryption. So that's actually way more secure than a phone call because you remember phone calls if, I don't know how, how old everyone is in the room, but if you remember Charlie's Angels back in the day, they used to always climb a phone pole and tap in the, uh, the line to, to, to listen to, to the conversation. Can't do that with Link. In fact, it was actually a pleasant, uh, pleasant um, uh, surprise for me to be able to go and present it to our security team and our uh, general counsel to talk about how using Link will actually give us greater security um, um, uh, out there as well. But the thing is, is that with Federation, uh, with presence and such, we actually had to turn on um, enhanced privacy, which actually by default didn't share your, your presence with people. When we first enabled that internally, this is before we actually started federating internally, we just had open security. And that was very powerful in that you could easily see uh, whether somebody was available on the phone or, or not. But uh, two drivers actually pushed us to turn on the uh, enhanced privacy. One is that attorneys are, are, are somewhat private and they didn't necessarily want somebody in the New York office to be able to see if they're in the LA office, if they're in the office yet working or not. But the greater issue was that if you left, the, uh, left it with open security, then an average Joe out there with a, with a Skype or, uh, or, a, or, or a link connection would be able to see if the CEO was available, if the CEO, COO was available. So one of the features that I was kind of hoping that they would announce at the Microsoft con at the link conference this time around was the ability to actually have two different security settings. One for internal, where we actually by default would want, uh, would want uh, open security and enhanced security for external. So you actually have to pick and choose as to, uh, as to what, um, uh, as to what uh, people uh, got to, to see. Um, from a, just a, a high level, uh, Link has passed all their security reviews. Uh, being a law firm with healthcare clients, banking clients, uh, et cetera, we had to actually hit the high watermark in terms of HIPAA, High Tech Act, PII, PCI, all that ilk uh, out there. It's passed. We can talk about it spe specifically if you wanted to. Uh, uh, to know details uh, after the fact. We, we do. We are federated ex externally now, and we actually have a pop-up message that by default shows up that says that while Holland and Knight doesn't record any instant messaging internally, if you're c collaborating with an external party, the messages uh, could be recorded. Almost like the same disclaimer you see from any law firm when you communicate with them on, uh, on email. So the, the marketing plan, how, how do we actually push this out? We really changed the focus. You heard us talk about a few times how there's that certain sort of almost stigma that link with I am is like it's you know it's you know it's something that my kids use. It's not it's not an enterprise uh, functional system. Well, we pushed all that aside by doing two things. One, we stopped talking about the link phone system and we're saying this is a new phone system that happens to integrate with link. Uh, we started pushing out the conference phones, which actually just had that functionality. And people asked, well, why does this integrate with link? And then we'd be like, it's actually link. Um, but the whole thing is that we also started building a buzz with the new features. We really went on a marketing campaign to create the awareness of the functionality that people would get in terms of being able to have audio conferencing, whiteboarding, ad hoc uh, collaboration, the ability to do uh, internal five-digit dialing on your, uh, on your phone number and such. And we did it in such a way for, for two reasons. One, we knew that we were going to have problems as we, we, we moved off of our old PBX system. It's a fact of life. You know, you just need to uh, accommodate for it, uh, deploy it, and, uh, and we had a rollback plan where, you know, our existing PBX offices, we had a, a hybrid. So we picked the offices that only had PBX phones. That really allowed us to plug in these VoIP-based phones and have both systems working uh, at the same time so that even from a cutover perspective, and this is virtual now, but it's just you literally unplug the PRI from the old switch, plug it into the, the, uh, the new switch, everything working, great, doesn't work, unplug it, plug it back in. Easy fail forward, fail back, so that again, we were able to build that comfort level in turn, uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the people. In fact, with the Sonos gateways, we just, we just do it virtually. We didn't even have to, have to make any, any changes there. And again, we focused on dial tone replacement. And even though that's the most uh, archaic feature, that's what our users demanded the most. And then we focus on the phone plus functionality afterwards. And, uh, and that's, a, that's the reason why we chose Link. But people only had to use that functionality if they chose to. And by also building that buzz and that, that goodwill, we had that goodwill to know that 
This is why we're changing something so core uh, as their normal dial tone to give them all the functionality uh, that came uh, after the fact. So where are we now, current status? So currently we, we have our SBAs deployed to, those, to the initial offices. Um, we have the integration with Avaya and we have the ability in, those, in, in the initial offices to enable somebody for Link and it takes their phone and they, they can be a Link user. Um, we don't have the office completely migrated yet. We have it in a pilot mode. We have users actually throughout the whole firm in a pilot mode. Um, and we're looking, hopefully, in the next couple weeks, we'll, we'll have that first one under our belt. Um, as we mentioned, we have the CX3000 phones uh, deployed in production in some offices. Um, we were going with the VVX uh, series phones from Polycom. And, and that was something interesting there. So the VVX400, you know, is one of their lower end phones. They have the 500 and 600 series uh, as well. And there's some things that we actually really liked about the 600. It had the, uh, the ability to have Bluetooth. Um, you know, the cost differential wasn't that much of a problem for us. But the touch screen for us just wasn't, wasn't as easy to use as, as we were hoping it would be. And going back to Dean's point about everything being easy to use, somebody who's really used to just a normal phone, having, having the touch screen there, sometimes you accidentally call somebody that you didn't mean to if you bump it. And it just wasn't a really good user experience for, for us. So some organizations, you know, may, may appreciate it more or adapt to it more. Um, but for us, you know, we really wish there was a higher, higher end button phone that we could find that would integrate because, you know, that'd be really a, a good driver for us, having more features but having the same, the same um, hard buttons. And that's actually what we were doing with Cisco. We were looking at one of their higher phones but not a touchscreen because of the same kind of issues just in our environment. We just didn't really like it. Um, and, you know, some of our goals going forward is once we start this migration, we really want to push to try and get it through it as quickly as possible. Because, you know, if we have it integrated with the Avaya, we can, we have to call back and forth, but there's still things that, that could get confusing for people. So if they call somebody, they call a contact in Link, you know, they can end up calling the person's computer instead of calling their phone, and it, you know, frustrates them. And it's a training issue while we're in that, that stage, but just things that we try to get through as quickly as possible so we don't have, have that happen. Um, another thing that we're still missing, unfortunately, is the intercom feature. So some offices care about that more than others. Um, so again, you know, our, our VAR is helping us with that to look at different ways to work around that, you know, whether it's a workflow issue of making a phone call or, or just making sure they know to use IM when they're in the training session. So this is how you can communicate back to them if you're, if you're trying to do something with them. So just awareness of everything that we have and, and that user acceptance is what we're driving for. So feedback, what do people like right now? Um, universal access on multiple devices. Um, I personally carry an, an Android phone, an iPad, and a Surface tablet, and I'm logged onto all those devices, and sometimes it just drives me crazy when the phone rings, because it just, <laughs> it just rings my head off. But it's, it, it, it works, and it works well. The five-digit dialing that I talked about, the ability to augment uh, poor uh, cellular coverage, or even Wi-Fi only devices. Uh, my iPad is Wi-Fi only, but I can still make and receive phone calls on it over Wi-Fi because of the uh, Link, uh, the, the Link client. Audio conference, when you initiate a, an audio conference, you get a full dashboard of everyone that's connected, whether it's their link name or the phone number that they've dialed in and on. That's very powerful because from a confidentiality and privilege perspective, it's important for our attorneys to be able to see who's on the phone, who's talking, especially with the, with the large conferences and such. And it's interesting that now that functionality is available, people are now moving out of the video conferencing rooms and actually going into the, the audio conferences because they are able to tell, oh, is that, is that George or is that Fred? You can actually see uh, who's actually uh, speaking there. Um, easy to create a collaboration appointment. It's just a simple button when you're making an appointment in length. You have all the information there. The other side can just click on it and, uh, and be connected. Uh, better together over internet, the, uh, over Ethernet, excuse me. The ability to click to call on, on your phone uh, has been very powerful. And the one interesting thing is even though more people are moving to audio conferencing and such, uh, the video calling is something that people are commenting now that they're pushing to do to ensure that there's engagement in the conversation on the other end so that people aren't checking their email or otherwise, uh, uh, or, uh, otherwise uh, distracted. Uh, what are the user concerns? Uh, attend and call pickup. You know, and this was one of the, the issues as to why we didn't start deploying uh, the link phone system until we had the handsets to lo the level of maturity that it is now, in that when you have the four to one ratio, if you're one assistant and you're doing something on your, on, on your desktop versus your computer, and your computer locks itself, because we have the security that does that, all of a sudden the phone rings, you have to control, delete, you have to enter your six digit alphanumeric password, you have to have the screen unlocked, 
you have to flip to the link screen in order to be able to figure out who's calling whom and, and pick it up. That, that was initially a concern that we're now uh, addressing with being able to have the, the buttons just uh, there's flash. Um, voicemails being diverted to, um, to a cell phone uh, voicemail client, a little bit of a concern, that's a training issue. We want to make sure that voicemails go only to a firm uh, controlled device and not to a home uh, voicemail system or what have you where we lose control and possibly have some uh, confidentiality, uh, confidentiality issues. Call quality, I think I talked about it before in terms of the, the, the underlying uh, transport uh, and such. Um, there's also the, the issue in that you know, when you're making a VoIP call, it's, it's a data connection. It's, it's not a voice-based uh, connection. So if you're using Verizon as, as an example, currently they're, they're using their, their CDMA network for, actual, uh, for, for the data component, and then their, their voice network is, is, is split apart. So um, you may have great voice quality, but your data connection may not be as good. So there's some frustration with the users to understand uh, why a VoIP call isn't working well and why a, uh, a voice call is, is, is working well. Um, there's also the issue where if somebody calls in on, on, uh, on your regular phone number when you're on a link data call, it actually drops the, uh, the, the link call because that's what takes the priority. And again, with the Verizon network as the example, it's a completely different network. So it actually drops your, your data connection altogether when you're, uh, uh, when you're uh, on, on the phone. Um, the link UI could be better. I think I alluded earlier that some contextually aware uh, interface would actually uh, be nice. Um, you know, I think two examples is, you know, I federated with some peers and some uh, other uh, law firms. And I think it took us about 10 minutes to initiate a group video ad hoc call just by clicking around to figure out where the buttons were. And what was your example with the trainers uh, the other day? So, so we had some trainers looking at, at Link, just looking at the plans for it. And they were trying to figure out how to merge a call together. And one of the trainers had come to me and he said, we just spent 10 minutes trying to figure out how to merge a call together and we didn't find it. So, you know, I, I showed him on my desktop how to do it, and he goes, oh, it's very easy, but he's like, my goodness, I would not have found that myself. You know, I, we tried to find it ourselves, and three of them didn't, so it's really just not as intuitive as you'd hope. But it's getting there, and uh, I took the opportunity in the green room to mention that to Gurdeep, so hopefully that will come, <laughs> come, come out in the, uh, in the next feature there. Um, in terms of the, the handsets, I think they're really 85% there. I mean, for, from the sustance for our purposes, and again, this is unique to professional services uh, for us, is uh, it, it's ready for us to start deploying there. The, the loss of functionality, such as the, the intercom, um, it's coming back in a, in a future release, and really the, the benefits now outweigh the, uh, the, the, the cons in terms of uh, moving forward with the deployment. Uh, but there are challenges. So some of the stuff that we, we've been looking at as a challenge is, is a learning curve. So, you know, we have a voice engineer. He's been doing voice for 20 plus years. Um, it's a huge change. So, you know, it's still voice there, but now it's all IP. And even though he was doing IP voice with our old Avaya system, it's completely different. And it becomes, you know, a mixture of being a link mat admin and, and a voice engineer at the same time, really, to have a good understanding of it. So being able to make sure that we plan for training of the admins and that they have a really good understanding of how to keep this thing going once it's deployed in our environment is one of the things we're, we're concerned about. Um, applying voice level change control to Link. So again, in our PBX environment, it was very structured, very, very controlled what we did to it. We didn't go around making a lot of changes. And in Windows environment, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people can have access to it versus in the PBX, it was very limited. You know, just the people who really, really knew what they were doing could do anything to it. And with the link in Windows, it's a, it's a concern. So you really have to have that organizational maturity there to have a very strong change control when you're doing something to it that you don't break voice at that time. So it's one of the, another, another thing that we're, we're um, looking at. And it also goes back to the support options. So how, how are we going to get that support that we had before if, if we do decide that we need it? And what, are, what, is a, what is a route we'll follow for that? Um, the reception console, so you know, we were looking at trying to use the soft console for our receptionist. Um, we've had mixed reviews from some of them. Some of them think it's okay. I don't think anybody's been like, hey, this is great. <laughs> I can't wait to use it. They're, they have those big old consoles today. Um, so it's a challenge. You know, we're going to try and get them to do that. But if not, you know, we're going to start look at some of the third party options and seeing if that might make more sense if we have to go down that route. But initially, we are going to try and just keep that Microsoft, Microsoft supported one and try and use that in our environments. 
Um, and then the last one was the video adoption, which hopefully, you know, we talked about already, but we're hoping now after today's announcement that there'll be something there that'll help alleviate that for us because, again, we don't want to go and spend a bunch of money on something that we aren't going to um, need later and that would actually give us a better experience possibly because it'll just be native again to Microsoft instead of having these other third parties integrate in. <coughs> I'm going to talk a little bit quickly so we have some time for, for some QAA. Um, outstanding issues. So E911 service and certification. It, you'd be amazed how, how companies really freak out when a law firm asks, will you put this in writing um, in terms of certifying that uh, it will work and that the ambulance will actually show up at the right location. We, we still haven't gotten a full uh, sign off on how we're going to address that. Uh, help desk call routing system is something that uh, we, we hope to maybe, maybe find a provider here um, at, this, uh, um, at the show to, uh, to help us out with. Um, really, one of the great user frustrations is that the call display on our existing handsets is for techies. Um, this number here, 813-555-1212, is regular call display. This is literally how it shows up on the phones right now. Um, it's completely non-intuitive, non doesn't make any sense at all, so easy to, uh, to mask and such. We're really hoping that they fix this sooner uh, rather than, than later. Um, the Better Together over an Ethernet client, which is the uh, click to call. Uh, we're still waiting for a stable release to, to come out. And the nice to have had some functionality that we're really looking for is the automatic failover from one data center to another. Right now, if one data center fails, people actually have to reboot the phone before it fails over to the uh, uh, out of the data center. Um, pin authentication uh, for a calendar so you're not to punching your password on a dial pad. I have no idea how to do that. My, my, my password has numbers and, and, and symbols and such. I, it would take me hours to, to enter that in there. <laughs> And of course, the hoteling feature, the ability to actually go into an office and sign in and have that phone si stay signed in for the day before actually moving ahead and, uh, and logging itself out at the end of the, the day. Um, the only comment I'll talk about this particular uh, slide, you know, the long-term evaluation of redundancy. We built a lot of voice redundancy into the system because we wanted to take the extra step of caution. Is that something that's absolutely necessary for your organization? Maybe, maybe not. Is that something that we need in our organization? Again, maybe, maybe not. I mean, our contracts are, are year long, so we'll evaluate whether or not we actually need this, this level of redundancy after we, we run the, uh, the service for a little while. But, you know, in Jesse and I talking about it, it's sort of interesting that, you know, these same questions and the same trepidation happened back six years ago when we first moved off of our voicemail system and moved on to Exchange UM. Is Microsoft stable enough to be running this environment, you know? Um, or not, and as it turns out, we have actually better resiliency using Exchange UM than our old uh, than our old system there. So we're really hoping that uh, that we're just being paranoid, and that um, as we use uh, our existing DR technologies and stuff, we'll be able to um, really um, uh, tune back some of the needs for for redundancy. Um, what scares us still? Dial tone expectations. There's some tolerance that, that your computer needs to reboot periodically. There's zero tolerance. You pick up the phone, there has to be dial tone on, on the uh, other end. The patching Jesse has, has talked about and the break fix timelines. And we'll just see whether or not simply utilizing the DR and BC technologies through virtualization and stuff will be enough for us to, uh, uh, to do it without additional SLAs uh, and third party agreements. So lessons learned. Uh, what have we learned from, from, from all this? Well, the key thing is this needs to really be a phone project and not a link service, a service project. You've got to focus on the uh, user experience and the change management uh, issues. I talked a little bit about mobility uh, already. Um, I stress again, change management, it's not about the technology, but how the technology is embraced by a user's workflow and helping them really understand what's in it for them, the benefits there. Um, focus on core dial tone. For us, um, PRI and SIP, it was natural to do, but it's an arm's length project. We, we actually fought our, our, our VAR on this uh, in terms of we wanted to roll it in at the same time and no, you want to keep this separate. And in hindsight, that absolutely does, does make sense. Uh, really talk up the phone plus features so that people understand why they're giving up something that they're very familiar with for something uh, that, that is new and unknown to them. So those wow sessions are, are actually very uh, important. When you pilot, don't pilot with the techies. Don't pilot with the ones that say, I really want to try this. In fact, you want to go and find the people who's like, I don't know if I really want to do this. I'm perfectly happy with the technology because if you can get them to buy into it and you can get them to say, yes, this works well, then it's going to work for the uh, rest of the, the, the population uh, out there. 
make sure as you roll in each office, you find key supporters. You find people who will have a vested interest in the success, who will talk to their peers about it. So it's not just IT talking to a partner. And that's not IT talking to a, an office manager. It's actually a peer-to-peer -peer discussion to actually, um, to actually uh, push that through. Um, and the key thing is, again, set the expectations for mobility early so that people understand the benefits. But the reality now is people do that, do that now in that landlines are 99.99% are reliable. Cell phones aren't. We all want and around, oh, can you hear me now? Hold on a second, I'm going into an elevator. I'm going into a tunnel. It's matching the same expectations now to say that it's the same fundamental cell phone that you're using. So understand that it's not going to be 100% resilient and, uh, and reliable. So one question that... Um, you know, I wanted to toss out here before we, we open it up is, you know, I, I wanted to actually put in the slide deck, but Microsoft took it out, is, is simply, <laughs> if we were to do this again, would we still go down the path of Link? And, you know, of course, Microsoft asked the question, well, what's the answer? Say, I'm, I'm not telling you. <laughs> we're we're going to tell everybody right here, right now. And, you know, would we do it all over again if we started again now? The answer now is absolutely yes. Why? Because of, of, of really three key things. One, it, it was a Link Mobile, it's a Link 2013 mobile client that really brought the VoIP there. You know, for all the talk as to what the functionality, that was the client that really made it for us. The handset functionality, which was a, a must have for us, 85% there, that's close enough for us to, to do. The announcements that happened today at the keynote in terms of the video server, in, in, in terms of the integration with Skype, all that functionality would bring it that if we were making the decision right now, it'd be a slam dunk. It's just unfortunate it's taken us a few years to actually uh, make, uh, make the journey to, to where we are now. Questions? We got Skype cards. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the question was, is do we use any cost recovery? And yes, we, we actually do use uh, cost, uh, cost recovery systems and such. And really what we're doing is because the cost of long distance is really driving to zero, we're using that as a part of a wow session that we're actually going to stop charging for, for domestic long distance calls. Uh, we use least cost routing and everything. So I mean, there, there's really no cost to us. And we're using that as a benefit that you're not entering you know, up to 20 digits, a, a rocket launch code in order to, to make a long distance phone call. Right. Right. So it's it's a non-issue for us, but uh, a, a peer firm of mine, and we can talk about this offline if you like, has actually uh, engaged a reseller to actually develop a client that actually has a little pop-up that actually allows you to uh, do a client matter uh, lookup and uh, still have that click call, click to call functionality. Yeah, the, so the question is that, that connectivity dashboard that, that I mentioned. Um, it's, it was in-house in developed, and hey, it, it, it's simple ping and latency time. So it's just a, a simple interface where it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a traffic light, green good, red bad, yellow, it's, it's sort of okay. And it's actually based on, on tier levels. And it just, it does pinging. So it actually, tell, it, it actually figures out which gateway you should be going to, whether it's East Coast, West Coast type thing. We're looking at setting up a European gateway so that you know, uh, when people are over there, it, it automatically goes there. And it's just a simple dashboard of, of lights to say that, you know, if, if uh, webmail is working, green light, well, that's the most basic connectivity you have. And it goes up higher with then Citrix and then voice and then video. And it just gives you the choice of, of options that are available for you to use. Again, taking the mystique away from it so we're not teaching users how to ping or, or, how, to, uh, or, or, or how to actually read uh, ping time latency. So it's just a, a simple interface that goes there. We've developing a little bit more where there's actually a button that can then email the information to our help desk so that from a troubleshooting perspective, it bounces right back to, right back to the help desk. We can see that, yes, you're trying to make a voice call, but you can see the dashboard's red. It's not going to work. So the question is, are we using a, a thin client solution with Link? We have thin clients available. It's not directly tied in with, uh, with Link. And you want to talk about Link within Citrix, what we're doing there? Yeah, so we, we aren't supporting it within there. Obviously, we have the, Citrix, Citrix, the Link client in there already. 
so people can IM and, um, and, uh, and do that, but we don't want voice calls going through it because we don't have support for it. And our, our VAR actually helped us find a way to block people from being able to answer the call, because I, I actually made that mistake myself. I didn't think about it. I was so used to answering my phone on my computer, and I was logged into Citrix one day at home, and it rang. I tried to answer it, and I couldn't do anything with it, so I just had the call stuck there. So it's something that we, we are just going to stop from being able to happen. No, we haven't. We, we, we saw it, but um, I think that our Citrix admin had looked at it, and he said it didn't support Macs and some other caveats with it. So our attorneys probably 80% have Macs at home, I think. It's really popular, so it's something we stopped looking at at that point. Are you running Zen app, or are you running Zen? We're running Zen app, so, but we're actually presenting a, a, a desktop environment to yeah, them. Yeah. Any more questions? Russ, from Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll let Jesse talk about the room systems. He's that spent a little bit more time with it. But I mean, the simple reality is is that um, we're we're already invested in the existing Tambra infrastructure. They're on a lease schedule, and technology always evolves. So as leases uh, expire, we look at how we can continue to further build the, the foundation that we have. Sure. And you know, I haven't spent a lot of time with them. I did get to see one in person just last week. Um, it, they it seems it seems nice. Um, there's some it, it follows a different usage pattern again. So. You know, we really have, as Dean mentioned, like that concierge kind of service. We have a person whose full-time job is to schedule calls, to connect them on the bridge, to make sure that it's working so they actually call and have somebody walk into the room and they say, hi, can you hear me? You know, do that whole test because, you know, our attorneys really don't want to deal with it. They just want to walk into the room and have it work. We've tried that self-service model before um, with having, you know, very integrated Crestron systems that, you know, you touch a button and you can make all this stuff happen. But in reality, it, it was easy and they still barely didn't want to use it. They still wanted an IT person to come in there and push that button for them. So, you know, I'm not sure if, how much it really helped. It, it is nice from an integration point that it's just native link and you have all those link features. But, you know, we'll see how it goes once we get to that point when our infrastructure is ready to be swapped out. So we're out of time, but we will be down at the Ask the Experts if anybody has any more questions. We'll stay around here for a little while if anyone has, it, has any questions as well. Please fill in the survey. Maybe we'll be back next year to tell you how, how it all worked as, as we finish out the, the full uh, deployment. And those of you who ask questions, come on up and claim your, uh, your link cards. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>